Do the works of Jesus Christ. The works of Jesus Christ are so great. He died on the cross. He redeemed us. He paid with his own blood. Can I do the works of Jesus Christ? So anyway, I want to uh, share a message that is on my heart on, on this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, here you have the Son of God and you have the devil. And here you see that one of the work of the Son of God and the works of the devil. They are both presented in it. The Son of God appeared. He was manifested. He came into this world to do something and he did what he did was to destroy the work of another strong man because he was uh, stronger. The devil has been sinning. This we know that if you read your Bible. Since he misled our first parents, uh, men, women of all nations and all generations, we have inherited a sinful nature and we have been practicing sin. We have been living in sin. We were born in sin. We, we live a sinful uh, lifestyle. And our society is sinful and, and, and its ways. That is what happened. It has become a continuous characteristic and a behavior of all human being individually and it has spread into society. So it says here in this text, the Son of God appeared to destroy. What does destroy mean here? Destroy doesn't mean uh, an annihilate. To, to destroy it forever, so you will not see any trace of that. That is not what it means. Though that is what we wish for, to get rid of him, Satan. Because, of course, you know that. You can look just around yourself and you will see how Satan is still at work today. So Jesus said he came to, to destroy the works of the devil. So it's not completely destroyed and he laid completely, but it is robbed of, his, of some of its power. It has been reduced. Uh, his weapons, his, his means, his control has been impaired. But he is still a mighty enemy. But, even though he is still a mighty enemy, he is no match for God. Because Jesus Christ, just as, and we will see more about it this morning. So the, the Greek word actually is loosen. He has loosened the work of the enemies. Uh, break up, melt, put off, diminish, and all this. Each time a lost sinner is one to Jesus Christ, it is more of Satan's spoils that is taken away from him. So you, your life, your testimony in Jesus Christ is a great victory. It's, it's something less that Satan has. And this is how we win the world. Is each and every single soul that is taken out of the kingdom of the enemy. It's robbing him of his control, of his kingdom, of his power, of, of, of his works. It is diminishing it and it is giving always pointing to Jesus Christ for victory because without Jesus Christ it's impossible. Amen? Hallelujah. I want to look at the first act of power that we read in the book of Luke. You know last week we talked about the first sign of John and that was the changing the water into wine. So this morning we want to look at the first act of power of Luke. And you will notice, amazingly, that the first act of power recorded by Luke is Jesus delivering a demon-possessed man from an evil spirit living in him. That's the first encounter of a demon-possessed person in the Gospel of Luke. Okay? So obviously the demon-possessed uh, people will appear again and again throughout the Gospel, but that's the very first instance that it is presented. And we will learn about the power of Jesus Christ this morning and how he came to destroy the works of the enemy. Luke chapter 4, verse 32 to 36. If you want to read with me, please do. Uh, 
and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. Hallelujah. This is no fantasy. This is no Harry Potter. This is a real world. This is a real world of demons. And one of the most a fascinating achievement of Jesus Christ when you read the New Testament. Isn't it? All of his encounters with demons is so like, wow. You know, every time you read one of these stories. Unfortunately, in this world, in this generation, among Christians, there's a lot of confusions about demons and evil spirits and deliverance and freedom and all of this. If you would go to a bookstore, Christian bookstore, and read all the books that talks about demons, you will be more confused yet than any time before because there's a lot of uh, reality mixed with uh, fantasy in all of these books. There's a lot of crazy stuff and to this one. I was reading this week, someone was writing on that subject and says uh, he himself was reading a book about uh, a demon of uh, how did he say? You know when, when, you, when you have a cold and you sniff and uh, you know it's coming out? <laughs> so anyway, that was a demon. So to cast a demon of this so that you will stop having, uh, you know, uh, your, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> some ministries Demons have become the major preoccupation. And let me give just a little uh, warning here. Like school of deliverance and everything. Every time you will come in contact with experts in, in the Christianity who become experts of one thing. Experts of one aspect of Christianity. Experts of one teaching. Experts of one practice. You will never find balance. You will, you will always be led into extremes and maybe false teaching eventually. Because um, look at Jesus Christ, look at the apostles, look at the context of the New Testament. It covers everything. Love your neighbor, forgive, you know, do good to others. You know, like it, it touched everything. Healing is included. Uh, our victory over evil is included. It's not one thing, Christianity. So when you meet uh, people who write books or con conference uh, only a topic on demons or on deliverance, then don't go there because you will come out really, really messed up when you come out of it. So the background of this uh, look here, um, it, 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 why we have the first mention of demons here in the book of Luke. I want to make you aware of something, and I, I did not really pay attention or notice it until I read about it uh, recently, that in the Old Testament, there is no incident at all, zero, of demon possession. There is not one in the entire Old Testament. Wow, what do you think of that? Amen. Demon possession only appears in the ministry of Jesus Christ. That's something significant. And the apostles, the act of the apostles, you will see something. And then, in the epistles, there is again no reference to demon possessions. Wow, what do you think of that? I never really paid attention to that. You will only find it in the gospel narrative. The four gospels in the book of Acts. Not and the, the epistles and everything. So what do you think of that? Then, where will you find the next explosion of demons? It will be in the book of Revelation, after the pit is open, 
and the demons are spreading out and they will exercise their evil over all, all the world, then you will find it in, in, that, in that place and that time, in the last days. But in the Old Testament and in the epistles, and the epistles, think about for me just for a moment as an application, the epistles it defines for us the church age, isn't it? The epistles is, is us, it's, it's about us, is the uh, church teaching and all this. There is no discussions about demon possessions in the epistles, and that defines us in this way. The, does that mean that there is no demon anymore? No, that's not what it says. It's, it's just that uh, there, there is no discussions about it. Demons always exist. Demons existed in the Old Testament. Demons exist still today. Demons exist. But the fact that in the Old Testament there is no mention of it, not one, and in the, in the episodes there is no like teaching how to and why and all of this and mention of the, any discussion on that should tell us something about where we should, what we should emphasize in our ministry and everything. So anyway, it it's just a, um, something that we want to be aware of this morning. The Jews in the Old Testament believed that demons existed, but they didn't see the demons as a threat to, to them. They sincerely believed that they had power to trouble people and to harm people, but they believed that they could be protected. The Jews could be protected on the Sabbath. Demons could not touch them. They could also be protected on the Passover and the special festivals. Demons couldn't understand Hebrews, their language. That's what it taught. And the best way to be protected was to study the Torah, the, the, the holy books of the Jewish, the, the Old Testament. So if you study the Torah, no demons can touch you. Okay, that is what they, they believe. So why did demons appear on the scene when Jesus arrives? Why is it? Demons exist. We know that. But something that we, we must also understand about demons, they work in darkness. They work secretive. They are hypocrites. They, 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 they don't introduce themselves like in the, the things. Like you have a, a parable in the New Testament and the Gospel, and I did not uh, write it here, but it comes to my mind where it says, you know, the, 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 the farmer sows good seed. Then he goes to sleep. And during the night, secretly, then the enemy comes and so you know, bad seeds and his, and his field. And it is done secretly. It is done during the night. Demons live in darkness. Demons occupied. In the New Testament, you see that symbolism a lot in wilderness. They are unclean. They are evil. They are unfriendly. They are dangerous and all, and all of this. So when Jesus comes, Jesus exposes. Jesus will speak the truth. Because you see, the, the Jewish at the time, they had come up with their traditional superstitious uh, thinking about demons. Like many today, uh, people have all sorts of superstitions about demons, all sorts of concepts. Many people are afraid at night to walk. You know, people will, will confuse vampires with evil spirit. They will not go in a cemetery. If they hear a noise outside of the house during night, they will be afraid, maybe there's evil spirit. When I became a new, a new Christian in our church, you know, like, a church always go through some, you know, a trends, you know, at some times and times. And I, I received Jesus in 1978 with my wife, and there was a time in our church in Canada where demons were talked about a lot, focusing on demons. And I remember a conversation between the young lady who was kind of our mentor in the Lord when we were baby Christians, and another older sisters, and they were talking about, yeah, last night. He was in my room, and he came to the window, and he was over the bed, and I said, and I said, then Jesus' name, and then he went away by the window. So this is kind of the, the some conversations that we we heard when we were young Christian, and and all sorts of different things. And one day we had the one guy 
who always talked about demons all the time. Every conversation is all about demons. And it was Sunday afternoon and we were having a fellowship in our home and it was and there was a storm outside. Like you know sometimes that the clouds get very gray and then the afternoon it's almost like evening like uh, you know. So it was like some kind of a atmosphere like that and we were talking about demons, you know, and everything. <laughs> Listening to this guy like we were baby Christians so he was yeah, instructing us on demons and then suddenly Bang! And the lights switch off. Oh, demons. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what I'm saying is that we, we develop all sorts of ideas about demons and we live scared about demons and all this. But when Jesus arrives, he exposes them. He takes their, their secretive and, uh, you know, the things that, the subtle things that they do and the clandestine way of reaching out to people and exercising their power and cheating people, lying to people, you know, g getting people uh, uh, cap captives, you know, in their trap. And Jesus exposed that. He says, this is what happens. So the writer is giving us the first act of power that is important, and we will see why he is doing he is doing that. Jesus came to tell the truth. He understand the agenda of demons, and Jesus Christ proved his authority. Nobody before Jesus could demonstrate this kind of authority. Jesus Christ is unique. Say amen. amen. You're the one that you follow. He is unique, and we also see his immense and complete power over them all. The devil has an agent, agenda against God and against his people and the plan of God. Hallelujah. But let me tell you something. As you see every encounter of Jesus Christ with demons, you will always see. They know who Jesus is. You know, there's no questions about the, the, to the, then the demons' mind and understanding who Jesus is and why he has come. They know it exactly. You know, Jewish people, they didn't understand Jesus. The apostles of Jesus Christ did not understand Jesus. Nobody understood Jesus, but the demons understood Jesus very, very well. Have you come here to take away our power? Have you come here to torment us before time? We know who you are. You are the Son of God. You know, like, they know exactly. So, demons are afraid of Jesus. Do you see Jesus being afraid of the demons? Every, any, any, any time? No? I remember one time I was in Wuhan in China with, uh, I used to uh, minister a lot to uh, the African students community, uh, the students in China, and there was one brother that I met that had uh, come to China with some uh, special protection, something that he carried from his country, that his grandfather and his father, who were, I think the father was involved in some kind of witchcraft, had given him, says, you're going to China. You need to carry it with you at all times to be protected with the, the demons. And I was talking with, with them, and at that very moment, he was very scared because he had uh, he saw appearing in his room some fire and face of demons, and he was really, really scared. So what I did, I just sat with him that night, and I just opened the book of Mark, and I went to every encounter of Jesus with demons. I says, who is the stronger? Who is afraid? Who is the winner? And I just up make him observe whatever Jesus is, whatever Jesus has done, and what happened to the demons. And I says, who wins? Who loses? So it's only a fear that you have. Your protection is not going to you. Give your life to Jesus Christ, and you will be set free. And that night, he believed in Jesus Christ. He, he, he trusted the, the words that I was sharing with him. He repented. He gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And the next time I saw him, he never had any you know, weird things happening or any fears. He had been set free and he lived, he lived like a Christian. Hallelujah. So when you are born again, Jesus lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And you are in security. Amen? Amen? So don't never be afraid of, of the devil or the demons. They are dangerous. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. But not to you. If you walk with Jesus, if you trust in Jesus, if your eyes are with Jesus, you are protected. And we'll talk about it a bit later. The devil is often seen as a competitor, like a, almost like God. Like they always are fighting who's going to win in all this. The devil is nothing to be compared with God. God will always, always be in control. Amen? Amen. 
Jesus understands the agenda that the enemy has, and his, under, um, and his main agenda is to undermine your relationship with God. He is after that. If there's something you must be concerned about demons, it's not about the demons himself, but just be on your guard and protect your relationship with the Lord. That's, that's all you have to do. Stick to Jesus. Follow Jesus. And you will, be, you will be okay. Know that Jesus has always the full control and authority. So why is it important to look to write this acts of power first in his book? In Luke chapter 4 verse 30, Luke until that, that verse that we are reading, Luke has been concerned with the person of Jesus. So if we, if we just do a, a small review of chapter 1 to that point on, you will see that John the Baptist is the forerunner. He announced the Messiah's coming. The angel Gabriel proclaims that Mary will give birth to the Son of God. Uh, we see the genealogy of the Messiah through David, uh, the genealogy. The testimony of angels to Elizabeth, to Mary, to the shepherds, to Zacharias and Elizabeth, to Joseph and Mary, about who the son that is born, that the Christmas story, you know, and everything. And the testimony of the father when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, this is my beloved son, you know, in whom I take the, the, the delight, I am well pleased. And then you see as a crowning of everything, the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus Christ and attesting that he is, he is the one. And then you have a little bit further, just at the beginning of chapter, uh, chapter 4, Jesus goes to a synagogue, he opens the book of Isaiah, which is a messianic text, he reads Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, which is, uh, we have it on our slides here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In verse 21, and he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's, it's accomplished in me. I am the one, all this. So he takes this messianic text and says, today I am the one. So everything until that point in the story where this first encounter, uh, first act of power of Jesus Christ is described with a demon, until that point, all Luke has done is attesting to the identity, the person of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, who he is. Okay? And then he comes to this messianic text, and then there is a transition here. If Jesus is the Messiah, if you and I are to believe in him, then Jesus Christ must have a higher power than any other, other man. So Luke begins to tell us that he does have, in the first act that he chose to do it, he turns and he says, look, he has power over demons. Nobody, no man has that. He has the power over demons and all of this. What John is saying is that now the kingdom of God has come, has come to take over the kingdom of darkness. That's what it is. The sinners are kept in spiritual blindness, poverty, bondage. They are prisoners in the kingdom of darkness. So a greater comes, the Messiah comes, and he comes with his kingdom, and his kingdom is bigger to take people, prisoners from one kingdom, and transfer them into the other kingdom. Jesus destroys the work of the devil, as we have read, and he sets the prisoners free, and he transferred them. And then, because he is having a kingdom, there are new rules, there is a new life, new way of life, new meaning of life, and a new service. So, if you and I, we are going to be delivered from the demonic power and their influence, then Jesus Christ must have power over that kingdom. Does that make sense? Yes, and that's exactly why Luke is giving us that story. He wants you and I to be convinced 
that Jesus Christ is, is trustworthy. He has power, the power that you need. He is able to keep you. He is able to help you. He is able to, you know, give you a protection over the evil plan of the enemy, over the works of the enemy, and over your life. You don't have to continue to live in this kind of bondage. Jesus Christ is definitely having all the control and all the power that you need into your life. So we already know also in Luke chapter 4, just before that, that Jesus himself was tempted. Not only he can help you, but if he is to help you, he must also by himself be able to withstand the enemy. So he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and he was tempted for 40 days by the enemy. But what happened? We know he came out triumphant and the power of the Holy Spirit was even more uh, radiant over his life. So Jesus can resist personally the enemy and overcome him so he can you know, really protect you and help you and set you free in your life. The New Testament have different expressions about demon possession because many Christians have questions about it. Is that uh, oppressions, possessions, influence? Like, how does it work? And I think to, to answer these questions better, because we have come up and the English language with expressions and verbs. We translate the text. So if we go back to the original words used by the writers of the Bible, maybe it will be not so confusing for us. So the expression that is used the most is demonized. That simplifies it. Demonize. So we, we, we use different terms like tormented, uh, you know, whatever it is. But the, the, the New Testament used the word demonize. So, okay, what demonize? What does that mean? How much are you demonized? A lot, little, I, I don't know. But uh, uh, we have uh, 16 times the expression having a demon. They have a demon. It doesn't tell us more than this person had a demon. And the other one is demonized, used 13 times. Uh, in our text here, chapter 4, verse 33, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. That's how this man is presented to us. And the idea is that, is that the demon came in and the person cannot resist the control and the person is tormented by the control that this demon exercises over, over this person. The point of Mark, and I want to insist on that, the point of Mark is not to, oh, look at this man. He has a, uh, what, how did they call that? The spirit of an unclean demon. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that Jesus has power over the demon. That's the point. That's what you need to uh, retain about this story. It's not about the demons, the kind of demons. You know, some people, they, they read the story where Jesus spoke to demons and uh, who are you? And he says, I'm legions. And then out of that text comes books that if you want to cast evil spirits, you must know the name of each spirit, the spirits of brushing teeth and spirit of <laughs> n n nose leaking and spirit of c nicotine and spirit of this and spirit of, uh, you know. You, you need to call the name of that spirit in order to deliver the person from. What nonsense is that? The point here, Jesus has the power over evil spirit. That's all we, we need to be con concerned with. The, all the stories of the writers about the encounters of Jesus with demons is never intended to be a theological training for pastors or evangelists how you can have a deliverance ministry. It's never the, the main intention. Of course, we can learn something from all, everything that we lead. And sometimes the Holy Spirit brings us a, a particular application for certain situation out of a text. This we know. But the main intention of the writers of the gospel to show us Jesus and demons is not about the demons. It's not about deliverance. It's about who Jesus is, who Jesus is to you, and that it reinforces your faith, and you can live for him and trust him that he has control, that he has authority, that nothing can stop him, that he is the biggest, that he is unique, that he is strong, that he is God, that he has come for us, that he has come to establish his kingdom. That is what we are to, to notice and to the this kind of things. Do 
demons exercise influences a lot a lot okay uh, can demons influence people in the western world uh, it seems that we see very little uh, the kind of that kind of encounters in the western world we don't see uh, so much demonic activity as in jesus time but we still know that evil spirit exists why just look around you just look at the headlines, just look at the terrorism, just look at the violence, just look at how horrible men can be, how, how they can be uh, cruel, like, like a beast, like uh, having no soul to, toward other human beings. They can, they can murder, uh, you know, like they can do anything, they can torture. It's horrible. You just turn on the TV and you will see the demonic activities. So, so in the Western world, we cannot see there's no this kind of demonic activity. There are activities of demons in our society. There, there, there is. And the evil spirit used a lot over years and years at the beginning of TV, media, internet, education, uh, attractions of money, materialism. It has developed mindsets, the people, selfishness, greed, pride, murder, violence uh, from the chief of states, uh, from police, from uh, individuals, from husband and wives, from uh, children. It is in every single sphere of society we can see demonic activities uh, in, in our generation. In the New Testament, the demons influence with false teaching, false concepts, false philosophies. You know, so many of our young people who have been raised Christian, by good Christian parents who've been to church, many of them walk away from faith when they go to university. Why? Because there are demonic activities and the philosophy called like the, the, the Darwin has been an instrument uh, of the enemy in that one. And many, many uh, great thinkers of this century, uh, we see that the influence and the morality, uh, that's why they are called impure spirits sometimes, uh, evil spirits, unclean spirits. Uh, they also influence in attitudes, jealousy, envy, what you have I should have, so we'll take it away from you. Uh, divisive, di di divisiveness, pride, and all this. In other words, the work of demons have created a world system. If, if you go back in time, and you see the influence over generation to generation until now, and what you will see in the book of Revelation that will be the, the culminations of that, you will see an evil system has been created. And individual, it is affecting individual and it is affecting society at every level of society. This is, this is the world in which we live. The, the result of sin, the influence of uh, unclean spirits in our society. Uh, Matthew and Matthew and in Luke, Jesus called this generation and he describes it in this way. He calls it perverse and adulterous and evil generation. That is the word of Jesus and to the world in which he, he, he lives already. And Ephesians chapter 2 and Philippians 2.15, we have it here about the system and the influence of the, the enemies. You used to live in sin just like what? The rest of the world. Obeying the devil. So the rest of the world just like you and me and all this and every child, child that is born in this world and every adult and grandmothers and neighbors and police officers and government officials and everything like the rest of the world live in sin obeying the devil. The system, the, the, the mentality, the philosophies, the rules of societies, you know, and everything. The commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. That is very well explained here, what is happening into this world and everything. Don't, don't you think so? It's, it's clear. Makes it clear. I am included in that. You are included in that. Your parents are here. Your children are here. Your neighbors are here. Uh, America is here. Uh, any islands in the Pacific are here. Uh, any continents, they are all here. This describes exactly the problem of men. 
Philippians 2.15. That is now what you and I in Christ Jesus should be. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God. Wow, what a contrast compared to the previous verse. The previous verse, like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, living in sin, slave, evil, you know, and everything. And this one here, no, that's not how we live. That's not how we are meant to be. We are meant to be innocent. We are meant to be blameless. We are not meant to live under this, like the rest of the world, obeying the devil and having the, 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 the spirit uh, influencing us to refuse to obey God. We are not. We are to be blameless. We are to be innocent without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. But you and I, we are to shine. We are to live a different life. We have to have different goals. We have to be more noble. We have been set free from that former way of life, from that control, from that authority by the highest control. And we have been transferred into another kingdom, another lifestyle, another society, another concept of what society in this world ought to be like. Amen. That's great. You belong to someone so much higher. You are so special. Your calling is so great. Every single child of God, think about it yourself. You are to be without blemish, shining like a light in this world. Even though you live in a crooked and perverse generation, yes, we do, but not you. You're not living like that. You are not under that. You have something so much better. Amen. Amen. That is so, so, so wonderful. This week, we have been to this wonderful conference, Justice Conference, and we have been so challenged. We have been so, so, so challenged to, to hear so many wonderful, wonderful stories. Uh, Don Brewsters in Cambodia who is helping sex slaves and the stories that he told us about what is happening like and he says something at one point only those fueled by hope can ignite hope in others because he was referring to the sex slaves they're being sold by their parents there is a there is a, a market there is a society that is behind these these sex uh, slaves the family are poor they have no money and there there is a system of of people coming from other country like pedophile and everything and they come and they they want these child and they promise uh, uh, the, and there, there there is like some kind of a mafia over there like uh, maybe they would give six thousand dollars to the, the local mafia the local mafia comes to the family and will give 500 and the mother was says okay my daughter you you can have my daughter you know there is a system it is being sustained it is being working and people says no no it's not going to be a christian should not a christian should live and speak up and do something and this is what this conference was telling us there is so much corruptions perversions in this society and the church is not existing only to worship sunday morning it, that's, that's wonderful that's great we do it we are being strengthened we hear the word we are being equipped for the work of service, for ministry, for impacting, for, for uh, responding to the hurts and the pain and to, to work the works of Jesus Christ, which is destroying the work and the empire and, and the authority of the enemy and the life of whoever it is. Your employer, your neighbor, your, your parents, uh, anybody uh, in society, inequalities, injustice, any kind to, to, to be able to, to stand says, no, this is wrong. This is wrong, something like that. There's a story of a young man we heard the, the, first, the first night, Mark Weaver from California. Um, he read the book of one of the conference keynote speaker, and he was really, I think it's the Jesus Revolution, and he was really touched by that. And he was challenged by the concept of giving all of your money to the poor and following Jesus. But he says, at the time, I didn't have any money. 
So you cannot really give it to Jesus, but something amazing happened to him right after that he was impacted. He was selected by the, the TV show, the, the Price is Right. And, and out of different contests, he kept winning. He kept winning. He won two cars, a, a romantic trip to Paris and other things. The total was either 63,000 US dollars or 69,000 dollars, uh, thousand dollars. So he was like, from one day he was poor, the next day he had all of this, like two big luxurious cars and all of this. So you know what he did with that? He exchanged all this for money, and he gave all the money to an orphanage in Uganda, and then he moved to that orphanage. And, and he served there for six months, and after that, now he is a pastor in California. So he, he just like uh, did something with everything, the concept, like instead of being like a prisoner, oh, I have money now, I have two cars, I, I can buy a house, I can, do, I can live the good life, he just this is no, there's something more into a Christianity. So anyway, during this conference, we were challenged over and over and over again to rethink our role, our mission, our task. As a church, as an individual, uh, in my relationship with others, with the poor, uh, concerning uh, all sorts of prejudice in our society and everything, to, to be able to, to stand. Many domestic helpers here today and uh, you are facing a, a lot of difficulties. But if you always live in fear, and you always let them win, then what is going to happen in this society? This society will continue to be corrupt and abuse the next domestic helpers and abuse the next and everything. So somebody must you know, stand and speak up or something. Not because my rights, but because what is right. There's a difference. I can fight for my winning for gaining, you know, putting more money in my pocket and fighting against you, or I can fight for what is right in the eyes of the Lord. I can fight because the Lord is calling me to work against the enemies, to do His work that is destroy the work of the enemies. And I want to just close with John chapter 14, 12 to 16, and just finish with that, because we can see in this verse the call to all of us. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And uh, who is going to do that? What is the word there? Any, anyone. Does that exclude you, anyone? No, it does not exclude. It includes you. Anyone. If you believe. Are you a believer? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. You can ask, okay, wh why can I? Wh why is it possible? How can it be possible? He says, no, I'm just me. I cannot do the works of Jesus. I cannot compare with Jesus. No. It's not about comparing like miracles and demon, uh, you know, that's not. It's the, the, the work that Jesus came to accomplish to set free, to preach the good news to the poor, to bring the kingdom of God on earth, to, to you know, to, to the values of the Lord, to set free from the sin bondage, everything. We will do this kind of work. We will walk in that direction. This is the mission of the church of Jesus Christ. This is what it says. But how is it going to be possible for me? God is giving us resources, divine resources. First of all, prayer. You can ask anything. But I don't have money. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Just ask. Anything. Anything. Anyone ask anything in my name and I will do it. I will, I will help you. I will, I will guide you. I will provide what you need to do that work. You want to do that work? You want to please me? You want to do what's right in my name? I will provide to you. That's faith. That is trust and that is faith. Amen? Amen. Then he says, next, he will give you another comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. In you, all of his resources, all of his wisdom, all of his guidance, the power of the Holy Spirit. He first liberated you. He gives you his authority. He gives you prayer. He gives you the power of the Holy Spirit. And now he says, anyone who believes in me will do the works that I do. 
Does that apply to you? Hello? Yes, are you sure? Or you are not anyone, you are somebody else, you know. You want your name stamped on that paper here over there? You want your name? Okay, amen. Let's stand and let's, you know, digest that this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.